So, I had a whole thing planned for today, and then last night, I don't know how I suddenly heard about it, but uh, this man passed away, that I, uh, I only talked to a couple of times in my life, it was, uh, it's almost 25 years now, and uh, his name was David Ben Yosef. Mm -hmm. Anybody, they translated his books at least the first one was translated into English also it was called uh, Is There a Chance for Love that's what he called it mm -hmm. I might have talked about it once um, so um, I, uh, I don't know <laughs> how it happened because I, I don't usually during the day I don't I'm not connected to the internet <clears throat> I'm usually either learning or Writing, from 4 I usually connect, but that's only on weekdays. On Sunday I don't connect at all. And somehow I was connected, and uh, I don't know why. I o opened the Facebook, and I guess somebody put a post that he had passed away. And, and he even wrote that the Levaya was at 8 o'clock in Haram Nuchot. So I felt very, uh, <laughs> it was very auspicious. There were other things that happened to me the day before, and I didn't even think about it, but things that caused me to do certain things in the morning that made it possible for me to go to the Levaya, because uh, usually when I go to the Levaya, there's all kinds of preparations that you need to do. Mm -hmm. And I did them without even thinking that I was going to go to the Levaya that day, and it just worked out. So I saw that as another sign that Hashem wanted me to go. Right. So when I wanted to go, so I left, and I went there, and... Uh, First of all, I was shocked. I, I think this man affected, you know, tens of thousands of people without any exaggeration. He had uh, ongoing correspondences in, in writing. He used to write. He's one of the few people that still wrote letters, actual letters. Mm -hmm. um, apparently from what they said at the Levaya until Mamash the day he died. Mm -hmm. And he had thousands of course, like ongoing correspondences with people. And the Levaya was very small. Uh, there weren't more than 200 people there. So it could be that people didn't know. He was a little bit out of, out of, uh, out of sight, I think. But he never was really in the center of anything. He was sort of like he... So somebody said there, like, I, I never really was able to peg him, like, to figure out what, what, he, what he was like for me, because soon after I, he did what he did for me, and I'll say in a moment what he did, um, I became uh, connected to Rav Steinzolz and Rav Ginsburg, and then I became a Lubavitcher, and sort of his whole way of thinking remained in the background very strongly, but for me the figure of somebody special was the Rebbe now, and he's very different, he's much the opposite of the Rebbe. I'll explain what I mean in a second. Um, this all ties into what I didn't want to speak about. <laughs> You'll see this <laughs> hopefully. Um, but they described him, that he was very, very atzmi, what we will call in Chabad atzmi, means that he's not dependent on anything, he wasn't dependent on anything at all in the world. Um, something that I knew, like in the back of my mind, that he was like that, but I didn't realize to what extent, until his, his children talked about it yesterday, that for years, since about, he, since about the time he was 45, he would live off of, you know, a date, the whole day, or one cup of uh, carrot juice. How old was he when he died? Eighty-three. Now, what's his story? His story is when he was in his forties, early forties, he, he had the cancer, and he was terminally ill. Uh, they discovered it when it was too late to do anything. So he decided, well, if it's too late to do anything, I have to find something else, and. It wasn't that simple. That's how, he, that's how he told people the story. The story was more complex, as I learned later, that when he was younger, he already started playing around with uh, natural remedies and things because he was constantly ill. He always had a cold. So he wrote about this in his later books, but back then he just he sort of hid it. He, I don't know he hid it, but he didn't talk about it so much. 
but he had this issue that he wasn't able to uh, to get rid of cold, whether a summer or a winter. He was always with the cold, always freezing. He's, he looked very frail. It was like an istanis. He looked really, and he had he had a very high number on his glasses also. He was very uh, weak. And then he said, if I'm weak, it means I have to do exactly the opposite. I have to act like I'm the strongest. And he started doing that, and he said the, the big transition was he started going to the mikveh in the morning and taking a cold shower <laughs> before. <laughs> and then he learned that his, his, I think his father passed away or his mother passed away when he was very young. And he felt like he was holding in a lot of things. And then he started crying. He taught himself how to cry. What, after the mikveh? During the mikveh, like during the cold shower, he taught himself how to cry, wow. and he lived in Beitel at the time, and I had a cousin who was there, was very into natural remedies also, into natural living style, and uh, is very, is, is uh, the man I first learned uh, Primius with a long time ago, and, um, and, and they knew each other, so he, he introduced me once, but... When, he, when the cancer struck him, so I think he, he waited. I think he knew something was wrong, and he didn't go to the doctors. He tried to heal it. And eventually, when it was too late, it was like for him almost like, okay, so <laughs> this is the only way to go now. And he, he, he was cured completely. He never took chemotherapy. He never did anything. And uh, he got, obviously, I'm not recommending this for anybody, because the, the interesting thing about him was as much as he looked like a, a freak, he was like a yuck. Like everything was exact in everything that he did. Yesterday I learned that his children thought that he was the most um, extreme when it came to never saying a word he didn't mean. Like he was very, very restrained, even though he looked like completely... So I think he, when he did a regimen that would be very natural to like to heal himself... He stuck to it in, way, in ways that most people can't. And that maybe makes a big part of the difference about mm-hmm. whether you're able to, to use this or not. Mm-hmm. So I think he was very particular in the way that he uh, acted. So, so that's, not, that's a little bit about, about him. Um, later in life, I think in his 60s, I think it's interesting, he told me, I'll tell you about this phone conversation in a second, but the one time I talked to him in length was a phone conversation. And he told me then, I already know what it's going to say on my tombstone. Oh, yes. He died of cancer. <laughs> he said that. But my goal in life is that this will be late, you know, a long time from now, not now. But I know that I can't get rid of it. It's inside somehow. It's inside. But I'm holding it. I'm holding it back because I, I have my, my way of holding it back. So in his 30s, it was like crying. And then sometime in his 60s, I don't know where he, he chanced upon it. But he got involved in laughter therapy. Yeah. Like Imam just flipped it completely. Yeah. Wow. And um, he started using laughter. And there's videos of him doing it. Mm-hmm. Not, not many, but... And apparently he taught a lot of people in, in Eretz Yisrael how to, how to do this laughter therapy. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's where he picked it up. I, I don't know if he went there. But in India. In India. Um, so I'm talking about... Somebody asked, who am I talking about? David Ben Yosef. <laughs> his, his real name was Spitzer, which, which is why I think he's a yuck. But I don't know, <laughs> I don't know for sure. Um, so here's here's the story. I was I was very very old back then, and I was in a place where I felt there was nothing to live for at all. Like I couldn't bear the pain, and the, there was no no reason to live. I definitely didn't think I would ever get married. There was but like the whole my whole life was a, like shot. Forget it. And he called me up suddenly. <laughs> I don't know who told him what. And we started talking. Mm-hmm. I didn't know him. I didn't know who he was. I didn't even okay. know his books. I didn't know anything. And he just called me up out of nowhere. And he started talking to me. He's like, uh, so I hear that you're not, you're not well. And you're, I described to him what, I, what it was like. And said, I know some of this from uh, having had uh, cancer and being declared uh, terminally ill by my doctors and now that now that I recall I think he did take some chemotherapy because he described the but I'm not sure he described this uh, inability to uh, to function uh, for periods so it sounds more like chemotherapy than just cancer but whatever it was 
he said, I've had a lot of that, uh, and that, and then that. And you know, when I, when I, when I, when I faced death, when I, when I looked at it in the face, I realized that this was my biggest, uh, my biggest uh, helper, my yeah. biggest ally. What again? Who was the ally? No, the death. death. Yeah. So dead. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> like for so, like I did in the days, I didn't think I was hearing him right. Now. And he began to speak, and and he told me something. He th- he said a lot of things. Two things that, s- that struck me, and that I've carried with me to this day. Well, I don't think I do them, but I can't get them out of my head. He loved doing Russia tables from different mm-hmm. things. So I, you've heard this from me before, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe you remember it. He had this thing from Tehillim in, in Pelk Tadzain, I think, or Yudzain. It says Tovati Bal Alecha. That Tovati Bal Alecha. The David says to Hashem, "My goodness, meaning my having a good life, as it were, Bal Alecha, is not your responsibility." Who's you? Hashem. It's an incredible thing. Later, I heard this in a different way, that David was a bar nafla, that he never felt that he had life, and true. that he had no life of, of his own, no. meaning that, it, mm-hmm. b- and yet, that he constantly created the life. Uh-huh. He, he didn't just feel, at the, d- at the depth of it, of course, Hashem is giving him the life, but it's like, that it's not Hashem's responsibility to make life good, it's up to, us. It's, up to it's up to him, and he said, and it, it was wow. very. For me, that was like a, a turning point because back then I remember yeah. that it changed my my whole outlook because the only thing I felt was was betrayed. Hmm. Hashem, you gave me life. That's what yeah. I kept saying and to Hashem, now. and now you're taking it away. So what did you do this whole exercise yeah. for? And because of that, I couldn't, like the Rambam writes, that I, I wasn't able to, 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 to see the good things that, that I had had and told them, because I had a very good life until I became old. Like, like, and I couldn't acknowledge the goodness that I had received, and because I thought, I took it, I, again, I took it for granted. That it must be this way, it has to be this way. And suddenly, at, at age 24, it all broke apart completely. And, said, and when he said that, that was like the Makib Apatish. Like to suddenly understand that Hashem doesn't owe me anything. And as I, as I, go, as I continue to teach, you know, Torah to Nefesh and teach Rav's things and so on and so forth, I always understand that at some level, until you face death, you don't really get it. You can't really get it. It's like, it's this... Like w- we can say it, and we can, ex- say, and, but that switch, and and I have to tell you that I'm not sure that I still have it today because it's been so long since then. But but you don't know what th- th- that same uh, that same ability to look at things because right. you have to be in that place to to really feel it and to appreciate at a level that you couldn't appreciate before th- all the goodness that you have. If mommy, she can't see it until you understand that Hashem doesn't owe you anything. <laughs> so that, that was the first thing, and he said that the Rashi Tevot are Teva. That the true nature has to be like what we call second nature. The second nature has to be that Hashem doesn't owe me anything. So it was very uncanny that I was, as I was driving to the funeral on on the radio, I hear this story. I hear this woman getting on the radio. I have no idea what in the world this was connected to. <laughs> and she tells the following story that this I understood from the continuation from what I heard. She, she hadn't had children. She was, she was obviously older. I don't know how old. I don't know that story. You heard it? Yeah, yeah. You heard it last night? No, I heard it a few years ago. I don't know. So she she was completely broken already yes. and she, she didn't know what to do anymore. So somebody sent her to Shlomo Zalman Orbach. Yes, that's true. So you heard it. So 
she, she took a cab. She didn't know where it was in Shari Chesed. Back then, Shari Chesed was not like it is today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, everything was uh, broken down there. It looked like, uh, you know, like uh, the old buildings that it is. Everything was hardly standing together. So a cab driver dropped her off, and she went up the steps. If you, if you ever were there, so you know where these steps are. <laughs> she went up, she knocked on the door, and he opened the door. And... Shlomo Zaman opened the door. Yes. He always opened the door. Like, he didn't have a mishamish ever. <laughs> I don't think ever. Maybe when he was uh, in Basin or something, but not, not at home. And he says, so, and he says, with a smile. Remember, he's, he's uh, uh, Ari Levine's uh, son-in-law. Mm-hmm. Right? He married Ari Levine's uh, d- daughter. So he says to her, with a smile, she says to me, how can I help you, Geveret? So she starts crying. She says, come in, yeah. give her something to drink. She sits down. Uh, okay, so wha- what is it? So she tells him, yeah, I'm so old and this and that. And, and we haven't had children yet. So he says, I can't tell you how much I feel for you, Mama. I feel your pain. I know that without children... The, the, it almost seems like it's not a life, it's not this, it's not... And then he says, but I have to tell you something. And she's like, she's ready to receive the bracha, right? And he says to her, I have to tell you, Hashem doesn't owe you anything. Mm -hmm. He doesn't owe you children. (laughs) In fact, He doesn't owe you life. She's like, she was in shock. (laughs) She's expecting... (laughs) <laughs> she was expecting when well, I came to a tzaddik tzaddik gozel v'kadoshu he's probably going to give me a bracha and I'll feel better and uh, so she says he, he went on a little bit about this that Hashem doesn't owe us anything and everything he receives is matnat chinam it's a free free gift from Hashem and she got up to leave broke even more broken <laughs> when she came in and as she's about to to close the door, he says, "But." <laughs> and this is the, the the genius of this man, like how he did things. He says, "She turned around and she's saying, now he's going to bless me.'" <laughs> and he says to her, <laughs> "But even though Hashem doesn't owe you anything, if you do something for His children that you don't have to do." He might give you a child also. Since you don't, you also don't owe any of his other children anything. But if you go and you do something for them, maybe he'll, he'll, he'll want to repay you. So she decided that night that she was going to volunteer in different places. So I don't know how she, she said the first place she went to volunteer was a chalet. Well, not just a chalet, it's a bikul cholim in the, in the maternity ward. <laughs> Okay, so she understood quickly that that's not the the right place at all. And then she went to uh, to an oncology ward, and, and she started making rounds in different hospitals. Um, what's the end of the story? I didn't hear the end of the story because I, I arrived at the Halam Luchot. <laughs> but I imagine the end of the story is that she had a child. I don't know how many she had, more than one. But um, and again, it doesn't mean that the Shem owes you. He didn't say if you do this, and the Shem will. He said. He doesn't owe you anything. Maybe if you do something for his children, he'll, he'll do something for you to have a child. And in that case, it, it worked, uh, I guess. I, again, I didn't hear the end of the story, so I don't know what happened, but I'm guessing that, that it did work. Sounds like she was a temple. Okay, it's a, it's a lot like that. Okay. So this, uh, this is exactly what David ben Yosef taught me that night, that Hashem doesn't owe me anything. Wow. And... And it's up to me to, to feel that life is good. <laughs> Nobody's going to do it for me. And later I heard it in a different sense that I've told you a lot of times, that I'm the only one who knows how to pick myself up. Nobody can pick me up. Right. And that self-sufficiency in terms of the psyche is probably the most important thing that we can give people. Um, and it's very delicate, because on the one hand you want to encourage them. You want to be the one that picks them up. On the other hand, the whole point is to get them to the point where they're not handicapped, that they need you, but that they can do it themselves. How to get a person to that, to that place. So I think that 
you can only learn how to do this if you're really in a, in, in, in a low place. And you can only learn how to do it for life if you're able to come out of that low place once. And maybe that first time that you need to be picked up, maybe somebody can help you. But after that, you have to learn how to do it on your own. So that was the first thing that he told me that night. The second thing was, and that's why I say that the things changed once I became uh, a Lubavitcher, he, I, I bemoaned the fact that, I would, that I, there was no chance that I could get married in, in the state that I was, that I will ever get married, I'll never get married, I'll never have children, and so on. I'll be alone my whole life. <laughs> so he said to me, it was shocking, he said to me, you're alone anyway. Uh-huh. Do you think that because I'm married and I have children that I'm not alone? Right. And then he said, you're always alone with Hashem. Right. Don't kid right. yourself that because you'll be married or you'll have children or whatever, that you won't be alone. Mm-hmm. You'll be with people, but the existential loneliness of being alone in the world, that is something that you carry your whole life. Except that he at least added, or at least I hope, I think I remember that he added that you're always alone with Hashem. In Chazidus, we say that from the time of the Rebbeim, from the time of the Baal Shem Tov, that that is what made, before a person could really be alone, even without Hashem, because Hashem wasn't everywhere, as it were, at least in our consciousness, I couldn't uh, relate to Him everywhere. And the Baal Shem Tov brought that into, into brought Hashem down, as it were, kind of, so that you could feel at, at, in any situation that you're with Him. And in, in Lubavitch, they also add, and that you're never alone because you're also always with the Rebbe. That, that's, that's another statement that's in Lubavitch. But it serves the same function. That in the end, you can't really be together with people even when you're together with them. That it's, it's not to say that once in a while you don't have a very deep and connection where you feel that it's existential. But understand that being alone in the world is part of the human condition. It's part of what it means to be a human being. And I think that it's even more important to understand that that's how everybody else feels. <laughs> that, especially your spouse. <laughs> that in the end, even as good a marriage as you all have, a lot of times you have to look at the person and say, at your spouse and say, how can I... Uh, how can I um, help them? It's to strengthen their connection with Hashem. Because as much as our connection is important and good, it's nothing like that existential connection with Hashem. If, when I, uh, I saw this uh, many times uh, in my marriage, but I like to try to pick my wife up. But uh, what I've seen is that if instead of me trying to pick her up, I try to connect her more to Hashem, it does a lot more than when I try to pick her up. <laughs> doesn't mean that it, she says, I, I don't need your, uh, your, uh, your connection also. But at the core, there has to be this fixing the connection with the Shannon. If, if that works, then the connection between us can also get to new heights. But if that's missing, just I'm not a replacement. <laughs> I, can't, I can never be somebody else's replacement for their connection with Hashem. And, and so wh- what is this? And this is the third thing that I didn't realize until last night. That this I didn't hear from him. I, I didn't understand it from him when I talked to him. But he was, um, he, he was religiously involved in people's freedom. That w- he is like a religion for him. Other people's yeah. freedom. Freedom. Chayrut. Like he always talked about it. And... All, all his children and grandchildren talked to you last night talked about this that he always <coughs> never ever tried to get them to do anything he yeah. always right he always guarded their their free will and when I wrote a post about him I had to write that he wasn't a Rebbe because of that <laughs> <laughs> he was like a prophet but he's not a Rebbe because a Rebbe sometimes feels that it's better for him to try to take away regular Rebbe. I'm talking about like a regular, I don't know about the Lubavitch Rebbe, it's deeper than that. But, but 
but the regular Rebbe in the world, like I didn't think it was a Lubavitcher Rebbe, I thought maybe he was like a Rebbe, but he wasn't a regular Rebbe because he, he always felt that, the, that what he could give somebody was his freedom. That, that's what he had to restore, that's what he had to give back, that's what he could work with somebody, and, and that's why people connected to him so, so strongly. Mm. Okay. You so mean that people shouldn't feel enslaved to the Tavot? Or to anything. Yes. He was, uh, this whole thing that they described it, that the fact that he could live off a date yeah. wasn't because he fasted. It's because he was free of dependency. He, he was so free, so atzmi, that he didn't need all the food that we need. Like he yeah. just didn't, it didn't speak to him in the same way. He didn't, didn't feel, the body didn't feel the, the dependency that we feel. No, it's, 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 that's why I say he's like a prophet. And they, somebody there described him like he was a prophet, but in the sense that it's only a shem, and it's incredible because he wasn't very learned. You couldn't speak to him. You couldn't sit and learn with him. Uh, he never. Th- if I would have met him two years earlier or five years later, I wouldn't have been able to have a conversation with him because he's not intellectual. He was the uh, almost the antithesis of intellectual. So I couldn't uh, connect with it, but when I met him then, I wasn't intellectual either. I couldn't stand <laughs> thinking. I wanted just to, where I was. It was very existential. So that's where he touched people. He did an incredible job. So why am I saying all this? Because it's connected to endings. <laughs> to endings. We're at the end of the year. We're only a few days left. I think, I, if I would have to summarize... I feel very tired at the very end of the year. What? You worked hard. What? You worked hard. No, it's like it was on Friday. You didn't feel before. So, so that's one. That's definitely one one reaction that people have to the end of the year. And then at the end of the year, you have to cook for six <laughs> <laughs> six meals. I mean, in this case, or four or six, whatever it oh, turns out. I don't know, my wife has been cooking since uh, Thursday. We don't get invited out anymore. We got invited to one meal. There's still five left. And we're inviting people, so... Okay, so... What do you do with an ending? And... There's, there's a saying, I just heard it this week, that the Divra Yoel, the Satma Rebbe, he used to say, why does the Pasuk say... That the land of Israel, from the beginning of the year to the end of year. The second time it doesn't say It says to the end of year. So he used to say that when the year starts, everybody is, you know, all excited. This is the year. <laughs> And when you come to the end of the year, you no, another year passed. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another year. So he says, that's the overriding, that's really why you're tired. Because uh-huh. when at the beginning of the year, you're all gung-ho. Like, this is going to be different. This is going to be spectacular. We start the year after hearing a shir, maybe from Rav Ginsburg. This is the year to change everything because it's a Ein Chet. Tavshin Ein Chet is uh, is Bakesh Shalom, and it's uh, Rabbi Chanina Rabbi Yosho Ben Chanania, and it's this and it's that. All these things, and it's such an auspicious occasion. It's such an incredible thing. And by the going, they call it resolutions and so on and so on. But it's such a great time. And then by the time it comes to the end of the year, like uh, no. <laughs> Let's We're just done. make it to the end. <laughs> okay. It goes out with a b- dud, <laughs> right? It's a big bomb at the beginning, and then it turns out to be a dud. And all all the endings, all the endings are 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 that way. And the reason I brought David Ben Yosef into this is because he saw it in in death. Death is also an end. Mm-hmm. No, look at what came out of my life. And the truth is that, that you can go through this if you're a little aware of where you are. You can go through this every single day of, the, of, of your life. I started out the day, what am I going to do? And look at how it ended. And, uh, and really, you have to do tshuva one day before you pass away. And you don't know when you're going to pass away. So every day is, is tshuva. 
So tshuva really means, why do we have to do tshuva during Elul? And th- the theme of the past two classes has been that how do I look at what I did and not feel that it was a dud? That it was not. Okay, that it wasn't just, it didn't, it doesn't just fizzle out. That, not only that, but it could be that the ending is the greatest part. It's managed to turn the it's ending on its, on its head. Okay. Okay. So I, he- I heard this week a, a, a great explanation of this. Of making vows or making promises to yourself or making letters. Because like it goes out. Because nothing happens. It dissipates. It disappears. It's like diets that don't work. Okay. So, <laughs> it, it <laughs> so uh, the diets work until the next simcha, right? right. Uh, the, the next simcha, they're over, and that's it. So, wh- wh- what, uh, wh- what's, what's hi- what was his message, David Ben Yosef? That at the end is the biggest, uh, the the most energy comes from the end. When I said before that he took the his experiences with death. And from there, from th- from them, he he got his great life, the greatest strength that he that he had. And that's what Chazal say that Kol Shana Shi Rasha Bitchila Bitchilata Mitasheret Besofa. That a year that is poor in its beginning becomes rich at its end. Meaning that it's okay to feel excitement. It's fine. It's excitement. But Hashem becoming king, maybe this is the year, and so on and so forth. But he says really that the way to make the whole year rich is to feel in the beginning of the year that I don't have anything. <laughs> I don't have anything of my own. The whole year has to start, start out with tremendous shifrut. That I have nothing of my own. Tavati balalecha. You don't owe me anything. You don't owe me happiness. You don't owe me life. You don't owe me children. You don't owe me anything. It's very difficult. As it, and it's even more difficult when you have these things. And you still have to say, and, and, you, and you don't owe me. Okay, so... Okay, that's, that's what it means to start out with malchut. It's like the, the year is, is backwards. <laughs> you would think that when do you crown Hashem? At the end of the year, look at everything. Like, how does that work? The normal way of thinking of things is, I have a candidate that I want to run for the presidency, for the presidency, right? So I take him through the whole campaign, and after 18 months of grueling, in this case, 12 months of <laughs> grueling work, now I can coronate him. Okay. Mm. So when when should the coronation have been? The last day of of Elo. That should be the day that you, you, you make Hashem king. And yet we make him at the beginning. It's almost like Hashem is not the result. His being king is not the result of all the work that we did. His being king is something entirely that it's almost like he doesn't need us at all. But he, he does need it. So we have to, to, accept, to do something on Rosh Hashanah. But it's not that his becoming king uh-huh. is a result of all our work during Elul or from the previous year. It's something entirely new. It, it's backwards from, it's a reverse from what the, the rest of the world thinks. Mm. Yeah, you give first, so why not the first day of the year? Two days of the year. Said it. But you, more sense the beginning but it's it's entirely not connected to what you did the previous year. Mm-hmm. You're giving now the best that you have, which is in this case to make a melech. But and, and right off, you right, what's the story? Over us. Melech over us. He no, is a king. Said okay, but we mean that in our in our in our uh, consciousness again, obviously. This is a, this idea that really you have to start with not having in order to have, but not the opposite. You don't have in order to have more. I mean, Hashem doesn't become king because we worked very hard. Uh, so what do you do with the end? So what do we do with these last few days? 
<laughs> That's one possible. That's one possibility. So what does it mean to give everything away? Well, how do you how do you how do you do that? It's one possibility. Okay. That's what you said. You don't have anything on your own. You, you everything is away. Empty. So, so how do you do that? How do you, uh, how do you, let's bring it down. <laughs> what does it mean? Me- it means going out with a bang. Going out with a bang. Okay. Yeah. What does it mean to go out with a bang? What do, what do the going mean when they say that? That you're like about to burn anyway. So, so let's, b- you know, fire sale. Let's just go crazy. Not fire sale exactly, but like, Let's waste it all. Whatever you have, just, you know, we're going to waste it all. So if it's money, so it's like what you said, you give it, give it all away. If it's any amount of energy that I have, <laughs> what? <laughs> if it's any amount of energy that I have, so that to, lo- to use the last few days, to use all that, just burn the energy. Don't, like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> this feeling of, of we are. <laughs> what? We are. You are giving it. So I'm saying. So you mean spiritual energy? Uh, also, like, go crazy. Go to Kever David tonight. Say of to him again. Say it again. <laughs> go, go, go to Chassid here. Go, to, like, don't let it, don't let it fall because that's exactly what it does. <laughs> it. it, uh, it that's that's our nature because again w- we live the way that we worked hard all year, no, and nothing happened. And now we're so we're discouraged. It says uh, the opposite, no, not exactly that. Uh-huh. You s- you didn't start with anything the whole year, and you get more and more as the year ends. Meaning your work, what what it, what it's done, it's not that you started with a lot and then you know your ending is don't start full and end with an empty tank. It's completely the opposite. You started with an empty tank. It's backwards from what you think. You started with an empty tank, and now Hashem is giving you everything. It's like bizbuz al It's like it's the end of the year. Everything has to go. <laughs> Whatever energy was left over that hasn't been used, and you understand Hashem is infinite, so there's, there's quite a bit left over. This year, everything that wasn't done until now, everything has to go. He's doing a fire sale. And he's saying, whatever you want, just start doing it now. Start now. Don't waste another moment. In fact, don't waste another moment here with me. <laughs> go, go and do it. Don't let it, don't let it pass. Don't let these days um, turn out to be like a, like a dud. <laughs> and, and the... So that's part Why of it. You cook? You can. It's part of it. Let's forget it. It's but, but don't it. feel... Why are you? Don't feel that because it's, it's so much work um, that, that I've had enough. Just right. understand, right. once the new year starts, you're going to be empty anyway. You're going to have to rebuild everything from the beginning. It doesn't Beige. matter. It's entirely new. It's a new cheshbon altogether. So you don't carry, off, you don't carry over the uh, energy it's from one to the other one. It's, it's none. Whatever you didn't use, you didn't use. You have that much. That was the thing they kept talking about last night. That whenever he faced death again, uh-huh. for him it was like, well now <laughs> I have to burst out with all the, the remaining energy that I have. And what happened was that because of that, he went through it. Like he got through another bout with death. And he apparently had a few times, I don't know what else he had. But he went through another one and another one. And he got through it. He used to say that, that was how Rebusher used to be. That he had heart attack upon heart attack. And every time, he, he did more. He didn't say like, oh, I'm about to die. He pushed till the last one, till, till he collapsed. Yeah. And then he got up. <laughs> and, the, and the Rebbe did the same thing uh, during Hakafos. Same thing, they had a heart attack and just went on. So would you the, say the state of the psychic is like, I'm going to eat bitachon? Like, where is right? the psychic? Uh, more bitachon. I'm going to bitachon. More, more bitachon. More bitachon. The, the end of the year is all bitachon. It's all that I can do and achieve everything now. Everything is possible. It's the opposite from what we think. It's, it's not like the end and I haven't done anything, what I didn't do, I'm not going to do again, and that, that's the end. On the contrary, what is that like? The Baal Shem used to say a mashal about the uh, Mashiach. 
that he said, how could it be that in our, that our generations, our weak generations, are the one that will bring, bring Mashiach? Mm-hmm. So you, you heard this, Mashal. He said it's like a it's like a war that you do on, on the city that has really strong uh, walls, and the armies that are attacking have, have thrown everything at the walls. And from the outside, it looks like nothing has helped. All the strongest, uh, you know, all the strongest soldiers have, have already died and tried penetrating the walls. Nothing helped. Who's left in the attacking army? The weakest people. <laughs> the people who are the, you know, they're the ones who do the accounting and they do the... They're not fighters at all. They have no idea how to do this. He says even they're the cripples, they're in wheelchairs, and they're not even able to begin to do this. And yet, if they understand what happened until now, they will run full force into the walls and the walls will fall just you know, from their slightest touch. Mm-hmm. So he says it, what happened was after so many bombardments and so much force being put on these walls, they're ready to collapse. You just need that little extra push. It says that's what the end looks like. You think like the end is the end of, <laughs> it's the end of us. We're never going to get through. But the reality is that you're this close to penetrating. And so you don't need much. That's what the end of the year is like. The end of the year is like these moments mm-hmm. where small things affect, have an effect that is multiplied many times over because of everything you've done during the year. And the last moment to give up is the last moment. <laughs> the worst thing to do is to give up now. Because you're, you're there. You'd like to win you're about to win. And, and, and really, that's, that's what you have a coordination afterwards for Hashem, because he was he who gave me the strength to do this. But it's, it's the opposite. Don't feel that this is the, the end. Don't feel that this is where you fall down and there's no ability. So I heard a mashal from, I guess it's from the Rebbe, I'm not sure where it came from, that when... Hordus built, the, the, rebuilt the second temple. You know, the, the second temple went through a few revisions. So the, the biggest one was when Hordus, Herod, was, we're talking about from about the year 30 and on. And he rebuilt it. He's the one who built the Western Wall. The Western Wall was, uh, was, is his uh, construction. And it's the strongest of all the, all the uh, Kirot Temich, the, the, the walls that hold up the Temple Mount. And in his time, the Chachamim said not to use gold on the walls of the temple itself, of the base of itself, but rather to use sapphire. Okay. So they made it blue. It wasn't, that's why sometimes, I don't know if you've seen, there's a Rav Levanon who has a, like a, yeah. a model of the temple, so he does the Hichal in blue. Where is that from? That, that Hordus's building wasn't golden; it was blue. Hmm. And the Chachamin so told him kind specifically, of blue spot? That kind like Azur, <laughs> like, uh, that kind of like, the like the ocean. Like right. The and what they said to him: like Why should you make it? Why should you make it like blue? And not just blue, but it should look like waves. Hmm. Right. Like that. You're looking at you look at like like look like you're looking at the ocean. Hmm. You see, like the uh, the ebb and flow of the uh, the trow and the uh, the height, uh, the crest, crest and trow of, of waves. So I guess this is from the Rebbe. Why did why did they want this? Uh, why did they want the bay to look like that? So he says that they knew that this was the end. <laughs> it was very clear to them. That he says the real Chachamim knew this was the end. What was the end? So at 30, uh, in the year 30 CE, right, uh, 40 years before the temple was destroyed, they knew for sure this was the end. That was the year that Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai became the Nasi, became the head of the generation. And he was always of the opinion that there was no way to fight Rome. To fight Rome. Rome was, wasn't like any of the um, other empires that we had, uh, that we had come against. And more importantly, uh, there was no unity between the, the Jews. It was just impossible. There was so much internal fighting that he said that even if we were fighting uh, straw men, we'd still lose. 
it's like a decree from heaven that they're, they're going to destroy everything because we, we don't have our act together at all. So it was very clear to them that this was the end. So he says, why did they want it to look like waves? Because they said, even though this is the end, you should go out like a wave. <laughs> like a wave crashes on the shore. <laughs> strong. Like, like strong. Don't, don't like let it... And there it's a very negative end, right? Here, here it's almost, it's not so negative. It doesn't mean that the end of the year is going to be so negative. It doesn't mean the next year, on the contrary, you have all these expectations for next year. There's a lot to look forward to. And all the more so that the feeling should be one of that I have a tremendous opportunity here to use these last three days, four days, in a, w- in, in a way that I haven't done until now. Meaning, how can you sleep? <laughs> That's the bottom line. And this was seen by the Rebbe every year, that as Rosh Hashanah came closer and closer, every moment became more and more critical. Like there was, there was more and more action going on with every single moment. And here, and this is where, where, where I think the point is. Everything I said so far is just to lead to this point. That by the Rebbe, it wasn't that he didn't want to waste time, it was that he felt the preciousness of time. And that's the whole world of a difference between somebody who is about to die and somebody who is about to live. Life means that every moment is precious. Facing death means no moment uh, can be wasted. Understand the difference? If what I'm afraid of is to lose, is to waste, it means that I'm, I'm coming closer and closer to my end. That's what it feels like. So also, a person who's coming close to his end might feel, chaval uh, al I don't want to waste time. I, I, want, I want to use it for something. I don't have much left. I don't have much left. But then, the feeling is one of morbidity all mm-hmm. the time. <laughs> <laughs> that you're always actually dying a little bit because every moment brings you closer to the end. But if you switch this, and again, in our time, it's very clear that we're going up, we're not going down. For them, it was going down. So I don't know how much it helps to think about waves in the, in the, in the ocean for us. Here, it's, I'm climbing up and there's things that I can only in, do in this, uh, in this, in this year. I can't do that. I won't be able to do them. Not because I won't have life. I'll have tremendous life. But this is the last opportunity. It's not chaval al It's how it's called yoker azman. It's how precious every single moment is, because this energy will never come back. How how precious is it that I have this? I'm not nearing the end at all. I'm just feel the value more and more of what I have in my hands right now. When you die, it's also a new beginning. So, we talked about that, whether you could see them, but... uh, uh, You remember that we we had these discussions about the the eagle that he goes down into... Remember we talked about uh, how to approach death. But here it's not... This is not the type of end that you, you should look at it as. It's not a death. It's not a demise. And that was David Ben Yosef's secret, I think, that he never looked at it really as death. He looked at it as the preciousness of life. That if you can see the precious value of every single moment, it works the opposite from feeling that things are ending. It actually imbues every moment with an infinity. And in that sense, the end becomes really not just a new beginning, it becomes what empowers you all the time. Now, again, I'm not wasting anything. It's not that I'm afraid to waste. It's that I have a golden opportunity. I don't want to miss it. But it's not because I want to waste. Because I see the goldenness in every moment. That's th- the goodness is, is my, my responsibility. To see the goodness in things, that's my responsibility. So it all goes to the same place. Anybody that has trouble breathing knows this. Okay. Huh. 
when you when you breathe, you don't feel that you're. But if you're trouble. You, you you feel the preciousness of the breath. If you pay attention to it and don't take it for granted. And you can do that even uh, even when you are breathing properly. <laughs> That's why chedva breathing is so uh, is so useful, because it's it's a very strong way of of adding to consciousness the recognition of of how precious uh, every breath is. It's almost like you can't you can't get to it almost any other way. So yeah, so so really, if I would have to make a resolution, it wouldn't be at the beginning of the year; it would be at the end of the year, because <laughs> now Hashem gives me all the strength. So the resolution is like. Like the Rebbe, the last three days I don't sleep. Chaval is man. It's too precious to sleep. I'll go here and I'll say this here and I'll go do this for this person and that for that person. And, yeah, and people, I think, feel it. They feel this um, um, being so tired. It's been so, so long. It's because they're missing this point that this is the only opportunity to use this year now. And it's it's as infinite as it was at the beginning. It's actually much much more. It's Rasha b'tchilata. It's Ashira It's very it's very wealthy now. It's full of wealth. So those are so those are the the uh, the words for <laughs> the last year of this year. That uh, hopefully the next time we'll see each other that. It'll be after we suck the marrow out of, out of these final days. Mamish to take it, take it all. Not not to give up a moment. Not every moment is precious, and you can do incredible things still with Tafshi Nine Zayin. It's this is the this is the crescendo. <laughs> this is where where it comes to uh, to, to its high, highest moment. The interesting thing in Chabad is that the last day of the year is the birthday of the Tzemach Tzedek. And every year, uh, you know, everybody so. <laughs> and the Rebbe had to have a uh, for Brengen. <laughs> and the 29th. Uh, <laughs> nobody has time. What are you talking about? This is the, this is the greatest for Brengen of the whole year. Wow. Because it's, it's, the la- it's the last. Uh, the and who's, uh, what is the Tzemach Tzedek? It's the Chatchil Aribel. Mm-hmm. Like there's no such thing as as uh, the third Rebbe. Mm-hmm. The 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 mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Everything, t- <laughs> well, can, uh, a lot, and, and there's time for it all. I promise you, you can do more. Just do more, do more, do more, and then when Rosh Hashanah comes, it'll be fine because it's a, it's a new year. It's empty anyway at the beginning. <laughs> Just flip the flip the picture on its head. <laughs> it's at the end of the year. It's the, it's the base of the pyramid. It's full. It's just stock full. Every moment you can do <laughs> what you couldn't do in in in, in a week in the, in the beginning of the year. It's the uh, again. It's the opposite from what we think because we think when you get up in the morning. What, what did my father teach me that every mo- every minute in the morning is like an hour in the afternoon. That's true when it comes to me doing. But in terms of Hashem giving, when, it's, when you're empty in the beginning, then you're full at the end. And Hashem gives you a lot more at the end than, in fact, there's a Pasuk in Tehum that says this. It says, Yosef Rucham Yigvaun. It says that in order for a person, Ligvoa, to die, he has to add spirit into him. Yosef Rucham Yigvaun. He adds their spirit, and then they pass away. What, is, what, is that, what does that mean? That when a person passes, o- the, the moments when a person is passing away from the world, he sees much more than he could see his entire mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. So, th- th- that the end, what people call understanding and seeing yeah. and the whatever, and, the, and this experience. So it's a machalat nefesh. It's a it's an illness. And and by the way, because of that, we say that at the last we we almost never. I don't know of a single case in which somebody was buried outside the cemetery because because we say that everybody does tshuva at the last moment because they suddenly see that what a shtus. Like if I if I would have been able to see this before, 
But that's what I mean. It was sefu chamigvon. So here, the same thing. The, the year is about to end, but don't think that it ends with a, with a dud. It ends with the greatest spirit that Hashem gives into the world. It's much more than, and every ending is that way. Really, every ending. But the year is mo- more than anything else, probably. Who said this? Where is this coming from? It's from Tehillim Kuf Dalid, chapter one hundred four, from Baruch Nafshi. Tosef Rucham Yigvon. I said before Yosef. It's Tosef Rucham. It's not Psalm 104. Psalms 104. Tehillim. Like mm-hmm. Right? Kind of like total come, 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 come. And then the Hamtaka is probably the very last moment. The very last moment. Yeah. It's like that yeah, sweetening. It's a, that's what we tried the last two weeks. That's what we were talking about. That even the simple things that I did this year, at the end of the year, I have the strength to look at them and say they weren't it's simple at all. They were tremendous of Oda Hashem. Everything. There wasn't anything here that was just for, for nothing. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's not a pat on my back, but mm-hmm. it's that it was successful. Here, here, here I am. It's not just another year past. The best year so far has passed. It's not sure you can say this your whole life. Okay. You put everything in a completely different channel. Okay. I added more and more as year went on. So, so hopefully I will also be affected by what I just said <laughs> and be able to use the last three days in the best possible way. And, and really, I think uh, the last few, da- few days I've had this energy, tremendous energy to go out and uh, say to home there and, and do this chesed for somebody else. Uh, all this stuff that I... And my, and my wife has been completely on, uh, on you, you know, the roller coaster as it goes up. Just shh, uh, unbelievable, just flying high. Rosh Hashem, I really should continue. And, uh, and when we come into Rosh Hashanah, it should be like silence after the tremendous end. <laughs> after, the cr- right, after the crescendo, the <laughs> and then it just silence. So, uh, Taking their sons <laughs> with them, we crush. No, right. It's not that. Uh,